Hello, hello. Hello and welcome to the Mobile UX Marathon. Hello. Hello. Um, this is a weekly series of webinars by Google on how to improve user experience and conversion rates on the mobile web. Thank you for running the marathon with us, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anna. I'm based in Dublin. This is Mete. Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm from Dublin, too, with the same team uh, of Anna. Yeah, so say hi in the chat, say where you are based in at the moment. And also, since today we're going to discuss best practices on mobile web, please type in the name of your favorite mobile website. We are curious to hear what they are. Um, and yeah, so while we are still waiting for a few more people to join, I would like to remind you that there is a hashtag that you all can use, MUX Marathon. Yeah, where you can share whatever you want on social media to spread the word. Yeah, and uh, I don't know how about you, Meta, but yeah, the, there are two hashtags that I am following this spring. One is every Monday I check the Game of Thrones, and every <laughs> Tuesday it's MUX Marathon. And thank you so much for all your feedback that you are posting there. We saw really amazing scribes that some people did with the infographics and the short summary of the first live streams. Uh, we are really like all regional teams are monitoring the feedback. We are going to discuss the feedback from you today uh, a little bit. So thank you so much for that. So I'm going to go now uh, and introduce our amazing speakers. We have quite a few people joining us today, full house. Uh, so the first one you already met, it's Mete. Would you like to say a few yeah, more yeah. things about Very yourself? Quickly. So hi, everyone. I'm Mete. Uh, I'm working at the same team with Anna as a, a mobile UX consultant. And before that, I have four years experience in, as product manager and UX lead, mainly in the retail sector. Thanks. Thank you, Mete. Uh, and then we also have today with us people joining from Amsterdam, Stockholm, and Milan. So the first one is Lena Hansen joining from Stockholm. Hello, Lena. Hi. Um, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Sure. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Lina. Yeah. <laughs> I will be the one speaking very fast, so let me know if I'm just, yeah, springing away. Um, so, uh, I've been at Google for two years, and before that I used to work as the digital marketing manager for the car company Hyundai, and analytics and CRO is my passion. Uh, I think it's just the most wonderful thing that you ever could work with. So I hope that you share this passion and that we can talk a bit about it today. Great. Thank you so much, Lena. I'm sure our audience knows Lena from her amazing CRO course that was sent to all of you as a pre-work. Um, and yeah, we have her today to present actually a few best practices from that CRO course. And we also have Milan on VC and Emiliana. Um, hello, Emiliana. Wow, hello. 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 <laughs> Uh, nice to meet you guys. I'm very happy to be here today. As Anna was saying, I'm uh, Emiliano. I'm based in Milan. I've been in Google for three years now. Uh, I started as a app specialist, uh, and then I moved to the mobile UI, the fantastic mobile UX specialist team. And then lately, a year ago, I moved back to Italy as a mobile web specialist for the country. I'm very happy to be here today as I said, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you the best practices I gather. Yeah, thank you so much, Emiliano. We are so happy to have you here today to present the case study. And yeah, the last but not least, Raisa joining us from Amsterdam and with amazing content on best practices on accessibility. Hi, Raisa. Hi, everyone. I'm here in the Amsterdam office. I started at Google a little over five years ago um, from Mountain View, where I was a web developer on the French Studio team. Now, and then I moved over via London here to Amsterdam finally. So happy to share with you a topic close to my heart, uh, which is accessibility, especially in preparation for Accessibility Awareness Day on the, the 16th this Thursday. Yeah, the Accessibility Awareness Day is just in, in a couple of days. And I think Google has a few events happening around the globe around that. So we are happy to share a few more best practices with you on that. Um, great. So now I'm just going to quickly walk you through the agenda. So I'm going to 
just quickly remind you the main uh, rules and how we are running the Mobile UX Marathon, and then do a quick uh, video recap of UX best practices in mobile. And Lena herself will present uh, her CRO course and specifically the part uh, where she she groups the best practices around the Lyft model. Uh, and yeah, we'll share a few of the UX case studies and amazing content on accessibility. This all will hopefully take us about 30 minutes and the rest of the 30 minutes we will spend on answering your questions. You did submit a lot of really good questions on mobile UX best practices and we will be taking also a few of them from the live chat, so stay tuned. And uh, yeah, so welcome back to the marathon. Uh, if, even if you didn't watch the first live stream, you can find it at the Conversions of Google channel or on the Mobile UX Marathon website. But yeah, uh, whoever joined us from the last time, welcome back. And just a quick reminder here that uh, the Google and Mobile UX Marathon is a series of weekly webinars, right? So um, every Tuesday, there is a live stream happening in four different time zones. Every week, it's a different UX topic. And this week, it's UX best practices in mobile and where you can find them. Um, so just a quick reminder that, yes, the marathon is open to everyone. And uh, it should be relevant to UX practitioners, designers, front-end developers, marketeers. So basically, everyone who is looking to perform better on the mobile web. And please register uh, on, on our website to receive weekly communication from us. And please fill out feedback forms. We really, really appreciate your feedback. So going on to the feedback, actually, this, this is some of the few comments from the last time. And we really, you know, glad that you were so, um, I don't know, that, that you covered all of the things. So yeah, we did have few playback issues in EMEA and North America. And it was partially because we couldn't forecast how many people are really going to join because it was the first live stream. But yeah, and we had quite a lot of people joining. So we actually had to decrease the quality of video a little bit. So hopefully today we will not have these video playback issues. But let us know in the chat if they're still happening. Uh, great feedback on both uh, the Q&A part and the content. Uh, so as uh, so you highlighted that the content was really like setting up the scene and the Q&A you wrote was amazing because people could see the questions uh, being answered. Uh, and yeah, so also really nice comments. I wanted to quote here directly straight to the point. It was agile. I would like to thank Google for doing this. Thank you so much as well. Also, the feedback, like more examples, more case studies. Well, obviously, the first session was more like an introduction and uh, uh, going onwards. And specifically today, we would like to present you more of the case studies and more examples of what kind of things uh, companies do or what kind of things Google does on the UX front. And yeah, uh, send, send in your slides after the live stream and answer remaining questions offline. Unfortunately, we cannot do that. We cannot send you the slides after the live stream, but all live streams will be available as recordings uh, in the Conversions of Google channel. And uh, yeah, so answering the remaining questions offline. So we actually took a note of all questions submitted at the first live stream before and in the live chat. And we will be spreading them across the marathon. So hopefully by the end of the marathon, in each of the topics, uh, you will find answers to all of them. And yeah, is there any kind of certificate of attendance that was a really great point uh, raised by one of our uh, the, one of the marathon runners. Uh, we will have a look into that. We can't promise at this stage, but we thought it's it's, it's a really good idea to to provide the audience with some sort of a badge or a certification on mobile. And yeah, thank you also for sharing feedback on what barriers to mobile you are facing as a company. Uh, and yeah, basically all. Our research has been <laughs> double proved. Lack of time and lack of UX design expertise has been acknowledged uh, as the most common barrier to mobile. Thank you so much for your feedback. And please fill out the feedback form after today's live stream as well, where we will ask you about mobile UX best practices and what you think about those ones. Uh, on this note, I'm going to yeah just do a really quick uh, recap of UX best practices in mobile videos. So this is basically a few videos on the Mobile UX Marathon website. Uh, 
I would encourage just, I, I'm not gonna just repeat these things, uh, but they were basically some best practices around landing page navigation and conversion funnel. Uh, all best practices are subject to A-B testing. So obviously what works well for some of the websites may not exactly work uh, for your business model, your design and your business and your target audience. That, and this is what we're gonna be discussing today as well. Um, and yeah, so th again, these videos are available on the website and they were sent to, to you as a pre-work. But also, I think now it's a good time to um, let Lena to chime in with her zero course and presentation of best practices included in the Win on Mobile course. Hi, Lena. Hello again. Thank you, Anna. Okay, so I hope everyone out there has gone through the CRO course Win on Mobile, which we can see on the next slide. So the URL is there, winonmobile.withgoogle.com. And episode five up until 10 is where you really need to focus. This is where you really find A-B testing suggestions in design. So it's very practical as well as learning the process and how to evaluate your site because we all know that we get kind of blind to our own creations. Your developers can see episode two and 14 since that is around speed. And if you have anyone that you want to convince around the importance of mobile, then you should definitely send them episode one and up and one, two, and three. That is where the stakeholders understand what you're trying to do here. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to show you a bit of the topic so that you can hear me present it in my way as well, a bit less. Um, um, structured and and uh, more more honest and, and genuine, I hope. So in the zero course, I will go through how to do a quantitative analysis of the site and also qualitative. But let's just have a quick look at a heuristic evaluation. And that is when you take someone from the outside who comes in and evaluate your site, or if you use some kind of framework to try to see the, the site with new eyes. And on the next slide, we can see a framework yeah. that I really like, and that is the lift model. I hope that you've gone through this, and we are just going to look at one, one single point in this, um, and that is around clarity. But I do really recommend you to go through the course so that you see all of the different recommendations under each of these, these topics. So, clarity. The reason why this is so important, so extremely important, is because it's so often overlooked. So clarity is around making it easy to find, easy to use, easy to compare and to convert. But what we're seeing again and again is that people are are yeah on the next slide exactly perfect Anna. <laughs> people are often saying that being able to find what they're looking for is one of the most important things when they're using a site so in this study the question was when browsing websites on mobile what's the most important thing for you and of course speed comes first because it always comes first and after that was the findability the clarity being able to find now notice this, how attractive the site looks is way down on that list. And I just see again and again, the discussion between companies and agencies being focused on aesthetics. If a new campaign comes out, we're always discussing, yeah, is this our brand? Um, is it communicating the feeling that we want? That's super important, absolutely. But if we can find what we're looking for, then all of that will just drown in frustration. So whenever you enter a conversation where you feel like, wait, now we're slipping into only talking about aesthetics again, show this slide. Show this slide and it's on the CRO course as well. I know that you, since you're most likely working with UX as well, you know this, but often, other departments, for instance, within marketing, can be less used to um, words such as clarity and findability. 
So you will be the champion out there. Great. So the truth is we can't buy anything that we can't find. So that is why this is so important. And there are two ways of finding what we're looking for. Two features or two, two topics within the site. That is search, the search bar or the search icon, and browsing our way forward. So navigating forward. Let's just first have a quick look at search and why that is so important. So four times as often, people who search are converting. So uh, compared to people who do not search, people who search convert four times as often. But so often, the search feature is left behind and we're not really fixing it. So we need to do this. This is a checklist. Go through it and really evaluate your search feature. I've been seeing some amazing results when people dive into the search um, and fixing small details like spelling suggestions and having autocomplete when you start to type um, DRE and have dress. It can really sound like small things, but yeah, it's really good for the, for the user experience. So the other way to find what you're looking for is to browse your way forward. And this is one of the topics that's super important for mobile because we've been stripping off so much content on mobile. We've been making it so clean. We just want to, um, well, we don't want to overwhelm visitors. The problem is that sometimes we hide too much. So for instance, this is the usual setup on desktop. I think you've seen me talk about this previously because this is one of my, my uh, really very warm feature for me. So um, the sites usually look like this. At the top, you have the top categories. So it can be accessories, clothing, uh, shoes, home. And below that, you have the hero campaigns. And I think we all know that most sites get the most clicks on the top categories. The campaigns are beautiful and they can really inspire us, but we want to find what we're looking for. We're not, or we're very, very rarely going to a site just to be inspired. We want a specific thing. But this is what's happening on mobile. All of a sudden, the top categories are gone. They are hidden in the, the menu at the top, the hamburger menu. And that's not good for clarity. We want to be able to see what your site is offering. What are the top categories? What are the product categories that you have to offer? So be very careful with this because this is such a usual feature um, or a usual design that I'm seeing again and again. And yeah, there are ways to solve it though. If you go to the next slide, these are some of the ways that some companies have, have managed to work around this. So for instance, the senior to the left, they are showing their top categories kind of the same way as you would on a desktop site. Very interesting, very clear. Baby shop, to the right of that, beautiful way of showing top categories. Icons and words, very clear. And they have that quite close to the upper part of the site. So it's, above, it's below the, the first campaign. That's a really good uh, way to make sure that you first inspire with the campaign and then it's straight to clarity. Monkey doing the same thing, showing their top categories in, the, in a way that it's designed to fit their brand, which is super good. And weekday as well. Okay, so I would recommend you to go through the CRO course. And this was just one section, a small, small piece of it. Make sure you take each episode and look at the different design and start testing it. And let me know if it works. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Lena. Yeah, we would all recommend this CRO course uh, because it has actual examples and best practices, examples of from the real life and what kind of A-B tests the companies have done. And now we will also have a look into another UX case study. It's a very new, super fresh that Emiliano is going to present us. Hello again, Emiliano. Yeah, Hello. guys. Hi again, uh, very proud of this case study. <laughs> uh, Lana, you can go to the next slide so we can start 
uh, showing the, the first numbers around the, the case study. So you know ISPAC very well. It's a pretty well-known brand. Uh, they are global leader in backpacks. So with them, we started working on how to make the purchase, as you can see on the slide on the challenge, how to make the purchase uh, um, smooth, let's say, OK? Um, I, I want you to focus on the results. As you can see, we, we had the possibility of having an impact on CTR and CTAs, number of subscribers, mobile conversions, and on mobile revenue as well, depending on the country. Now I'm going to show you why this is important, because we tested the same idea on different countries, and this led us to understand that on some countries, something worked better than others. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, we can see the first uh, the first idea. So uh, the page, this, this was the card page of ISPAC at the beginning. And as you can see, the main call to action is black. Uh, it's not really standing out uh, um, compared to the, to the background. So my suggestion was why you don't test something that is in, cont in contrast in terms of colors, since uh, buy is the main CTA at this stage of the page. So we hypothesized some colors. One of that was orange. And as you can see from the results, uh, you can basically see UK, France, and IT. IT means Italy, of course. <laughs> um, UK, where the green one as a color in terms of uh, click-through rate, but didn't have an impact on the conversion rate. While on the other two countries, uh, we see orange as a main color that one in terms of uh, uh, click-through rate, and we have an impact on conversion rate as well, where Italy had a, the biggest impact. So it looks like even a small change on a page can lead you to a huge impact on conversion rate. That's very, very, very important to see. If we go to the next uh, example, this is related to ghost button. It's very important uh, when you want to uh, drive people to click on something uh, to help, uh, help them finding that element. Um, so as you can see from the screenshot in the before part, so as uh, the website was when I started the audit, uh, they were using ghost button for the main call to action. So it was very easy for users to miss them. Uh, I just suggested, why don't we A-B test uh, a normal call to action with not a contrasting button, but just a white button uh, to let them see immediately where the call to action are. And as you can see from the results, we had improvement in every country. Um, only France didn't really have a big impact on, on click-through rate, but three banners saw a 20% increase uh, in, uh, in click-through rate. So as you can see, the easier is for people to find where to click, the bigger is going to be the impact. Um, we can switch to the, to the next example. Here it's very interesting. Uh, as you can see on the left part, uh, I was trying to understand if the system was catching uh, that my email didn't exist. I, I just typed emiliano at gmail.com, and uh, the system didn't give me any error. And that's a, a huge mistake, because you are basically forcing them, the user, to redo the, uh, the process again, because as soon as they click on the button to go to the next step, they will, they will see an error message, and then they have to understand and figure out where the error is. Um, so one is this, and the other is the fact that they, it was possible to buy as a guest, but the company wasn't explaining why they should register What's the added value of becoming a member? Okay, so in, as you can see in the after part, uh, they were stating uh, if you create an account, then you can track your order, and you can have the historical part of your account, uh, you can manage your addresses, and you can modify your personal data if you change, for example, address or whatever. So they were explaining why it's good to create an account, and this led them to have an increase in 33% in subscribers. So giving a reason why a person should do something on your website will help them understanding if they want to do it or not. If you just guess or hope that people will register, but you don't explain why or what they will get in return, it's a huge bet that usually you don't win, trust me. <laughs> so if we switch to the next example, this is very important and related to what Lina just said. 
this is the search bar. So in the first um, website, as you can see in the screenshot under the before title, the search bar was in the header. That's a, the search icon was in the header, header, but it wasn't expanded. So I suggested that since the vast majority of the people that use the search in website, they convert more. And if I will remember, uh, Lina mentioned 4x more. Um, I suggested why we don't expand by default the search bar. And maybe this is one of the best case uh, in terms of impact on the revenue. As you can see from uh, the different countries, we had uh, in good impact on click-through rate on the search, conversion rate, and revenue as well, no matter what country you are seeing. Uh, so UK, France, and, and, and Italy. Why? Because on mobile, we don't have time. Uh, so we tend to... Uh, we want to, to find what we are looking for in the shortest time. So if I provide you the possibility of looking for what you are searching with a search bar expanded, you're going to use it. And if the search, of course, the search process is move, then potentially you're going to convert more because you find immediately what you're looking for. Uh, this is the example I was mentioning before. Uh, so uh, I was testing uh, the, the system they didn't get me the error that the, the email wasn't the, the right one. So my suggestion is uh, why you don't uh, use and leverage the auto suggestions for email. So as you can see from the example in the after screenshot, as soon as I type the add symbol, you show me the most popular email providers. This way, you will uh, for sure decrease uh, the number of errors in typing your email. And people as well will gain more time to fill the form. Uh, technically, uh, the results were uh, mobile bounce rate decreased by 18% the, during the logging and delivery process, and desktop bounce rate decreased by 26% because they, they wanted to test this feature on, on desktop as well, not only on mobile. Uh, so as you can see, no matter what the asset and device is, uh, if you provide clarity and uh, it's if uh, so, uh, navigating your, your website is easier, you're going to get a better results uh, no matter where you are. Going um, deeper in the, in the funnel, uh, this is uh, uh, the product detail page. At the beginning, they had the call to action add to cart. And hidden in the information uh, title, you see, that can be expanded, uh, there were all the uh, value propositions. So I told them, it's very important to remind your users, no matter where they are, that if they add something to the card, or if they are about to buy, or if they, they want to become your customer, what's the added value of that? Uh, so I suggested them, why you don't put a bullet point right after the CTA, like the product is available, the shipping will be free, without minimum purchase, the payment is secure, and uh, we have free return in 30 days. Uh, this helped them uh, um, incrementing uh, the out to basket rate uh, in France and in Italy by 37% and 34%. Uh, again, as you can see, UK status quo, it didn't change. So you always have to test something that maybe work in, uh, in a country doesn't in, uh, in another country. Other very interesting example of A-B test. Uh, on the cart part of the website, it wasn't possible to enlarge the, the image of the product. Uh, so I suggested them why you don't allow users to just check what they are about to buy. Because in the cart, it's not very easy to check the details of the product you want to buy. So they just added the feature of just click on the image and you have a zoom on the image. You can understand and check if you are, are about to buy what you are looking for. And this had a very positive impact on card drop off uh, uh, on every country we tested with a peak in uh, uh, France of minus 20% visit period to visit previous period. Uh, in Italy, was was different. As you can see, we had a plus 6%. So it can be good for a country, can be very bad for another country. So always A-B test. Um, this was related to product recommendation. Uh, always in the cart, 
it is one of the most important part of the website because your user has added uh, the item uh, that is about to, to buy or wants to buy. Uh, I suggest and why you don't sell something that is, or you propose to sell something that is related to what you are buying, what you're about to buy. So they basically have the added product recommendation in basket, as you can see in the after screenshot. And the click-through rate on that object was about 1% on every country. So it's it might look small as an impact, but if you have huge amount of traffic, this can lead to huge amount of revenue as well. And this should be the last idea we tested, uh, always related to the, uh, the topic we already discussed. So adding the value proposition right below the call to action, but this was a different section. This was the section before the payment, before it was the section to add something to the cart. And even here, I told them, you have to remind people what's the added value of buying. So exactly the same uh, value proposition, product available, shipping free, uh, payment secure, etc. And they had very positive, positive impact on the proceed to, sec to check out uh, rate uh, where UK led with a plus 26 percent. So it's always a matter of clarity. It's always a matter of making the life of your user easier while they are surfing your mobile asset. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that this case study was useful for you all. You can find it on uh, Think with Google. And I now pass the word back to Anna. Thank you so much, Emiliano. Uh, so now we have a little bit of time to deep dive into accessibility and I'm giving the floor to Raisa to present a few best practices of that. Yeah. Hey, everybody. As I mentioned in the beginning, Global Accessibility Awareness Day happens this Thursday and it's an annual event to remind people about why accessibility is important. But unfortunately, this topic doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. Uh, we should give it more than the 24 hours that it gets every year. And as a, front, as a former front-end developer in my previous role, I understand that sometimes uh, accessibility can be a lonely battle if the rest of the organization doesn't understand the topic. So I'm going to give you five, five high-level tips to help your company to understand the topic. But first, to quickly define accessibility, um, having an accessible website means allowing people of all abilities to access and navigate your site so that they can achieve the goals in the way that they intend. And it's important to note that accessibility fits into the topic of inclusive design, which um, is defined by uh, considering the full range of human diversity with respect to not just ability, but also language, culture, gender, age, and other differences um, in the human abilities. So accessibility provides a great starting point and coverage within inclusive design, but it's also important to consider how this fits into the broader scope of usability. Obviously, we heard a lot of really great topics on user experience and how the user experiences the site. So this subtopic of accessibility um, is really important to completing the picture. And when you take a step back and look at the impact of our audience with disabilities, there are over 1 billion people, which is over is about 15% of the world's population that have some form of disability. And within this, um, people with disabilities and their friends and families worldwide have a collective disposable income of $8 trillion, according to a study by Gartner. So it's really important to not exclude these users because leaving them out not only gives them a terrible experience, but it's also making you lose out as a business. Um, and in a recent study by the HTTP archive, we found that five million, more than 5 million accessibility errors were found across the study of 1 million sites. And this is an average of 60 errors per page. When you consider the amount of accessibility issues out there, so that like low contrasts and small font sizes, we're really giving our users a suboptimal experiences. And some, some cases, it's even unusable. So there's... Um, a concept called the curb cut effect, which describes when there's a curb, a cut um, into the curb at the edge of the road. Um, this was originally designed for people in wheelchairs for better mobility, but um, based on this effect, it has helped people of all different kinds of situations, like people in strollers, pushing around shopping carts. And based on this effects, we can relate to a lot of other topics to prove that designing for accessibility delivers benefits for all kinds of people. 
And even if you have clear vision, hearing, movement, or cognitive abilities, it's really important to consider the diverse needs of users because our own biases, what we think, uh, what we know that we can do, um, this can limit our ability to build websites that can work better for everybody. So I'll share with you five tips to help you increase your website's accessibility and ultimately to build a better web for everyone. And the first tip re um, refers mainly to the visual accessibility because it's, it's estimated that approximately 1.3 billion people live with some form of vision impairment, a little more than the 15% of uh, general disabilities that I shared in the beginning. Yet in the study of 1 million sites that I, sh uh, that I shared with you earlier, we found that low contrast was the most common accessibility issue. So to make life easier for this user base, it's important to provide sufficient um, font sizes and color contrast. And uh, this makes it easy for people uh, viewing on a screen reader, but also, uh, or sorry, to when they're viewing on the go, even if they're on their mobile devices, or um, if they have limited vision that's a need that requires them to see larger font sizes. And it doesn't mean just using plain black and white fonts and really big text. Like there's this great material color picker tool that allows you to see the different types of color combinations and tells you if they're accessible or not, including um, when you're at different font sizes. And the next tip refers to language. So this is relevant to people with cognitive disabilities. Um, and it's about using language and structure that is intuitive and concise. So really clear for them to understand. Um, may, mo most likely our, your website will be in English, which is the most dominant web uh, language on the web and especially for this uh, European based live stream. But uh, when you look at the global population, it's actually not that widely spoken or understood across the globe. So make sure it's as clear and concise as possible so that everybody can understand easily. And in the section of the Win on Mobile course that uh, Lena mentioned earlier, there's a, a great section on clarity that uh, reinforces a few accessible best practices that are simply just good design. So you can save a lot of words by using plain language and trying to, uh, trying to avoid using specialized terms that uh, maybe the general audience won't understand. So that's where removing unnecessary words will come into place. And making things clear with bullet points um, is going to help people to uh, process the information quicker and especially users on their mobile devices, even if they have uh, fully functioning cognitive abilities, they might have little time to digest the information. And uh, thirdly, clear headings and layouts, uh, clear headings and subheadings can go really a long way towards helping users understand the hierarchy of the content so that they can quickly uh, re notice what's important. Uh, and it also gives you SEO benefits by helping search engines understand what's important. So that's an added bonus. And lastly, using icons can help to serve as a visual aid to help users better understand um, the accompanying language that comes with it, or maybe uh, certain UI hints that are purely color-based. And here's a real-life example of uh, a company called HelloPrint, which is an online print platform. And rather than reducing just the unnecessary words, as I showed in the last tip, uh, HelloPrint reduced entire elements from the footer of their, of their checkout flow that was getting, on, getting in the way of uh, their users to make their purchases. A little bit similar to one of the uh, examples that Emiliano showed, and just to prove that uh, simplifying the checkout flow for uh, like just having general good design is really going to help to make your website more accessible for not just people with disabilities, but the general public. And this is just um, like imagine if a user was using a screen reader, then they would have to tap through all of these unnecessary elements just to get to the bottom of the page for their checkout. And by reducing this uh, less important information, people can get to their checkout, um, get to their purchase faster, whether they're on a screen reader, mobile device, or uh, their desktop. And as you can see, they experienced some really great business results with a 1.3 conversion rate uplift, which doesn't seem like a big number, but when you predict uh, the business value tied to this, um, this resulted in a 339,000 uh, euro 12 month business value, which you can see in the next bubble here. Um, so yeah, a lot, this small change and small conversion rate uplift can really go a long way. And in the third tip related to data entry, um, this is really relevant to people with motor disabilities um, because maybe they have limited ability to move around your page, whether it's with their thumbs or with a keyboard instead of a mouse. And also um, a lot of uh, the tips that Emiliano shared in his case study uh, also relate to simplifying data entry. So 
it can be as simple as offering the right um, keyboard entry, like a number pad for entering numbers, or offering autofill or autocomplete options when a user is filling out the form. That can really uh, minimize the need for users to type text and um, eventually make it really easy for the users. So um, when you look at the impact of your business, uh, we, we found that 28% of cart abandonments um, happen due to too long or complicated checkout processes. So when you simplify the forms, um, I'll show you an example in a minute, but um, besides different types of data entry, uh, one, way, one example of um, how to minimize the, the need to enter text is voice input, which actually was originally designed for people with um, disabilities, but now it's been expanded to the wider public. So we see voice um, search usage growing more and more every year. And I think this was actually a question in the Q&A. So I'll just uh, note that voice search is growing every year. I think in a, a report last year, uh, we found that 27% or so of uh, searches were done on mobile. And although this was mostly in the Asia Pacific, uh, a lot of English markets are catching up. And we see that Asia is really defining the way that uh, the future of mobile is heading. So in another concrete example, uh, Drixo.nl, which is also part of HelloPrint in the previous example that I showed, they wanted to reduce the barriers to login, especially with their high volume of returning users who had to scroll far down to find their login option, as you see in the first screenshot. And in a new variation of the login page, they reduced the long text and surfaced much simpler options to login. So there's um, just the regular login, there's a Google option, and Facebook, so that there's trusted third-party options in case users are um, comfortable with using um, one of those accounts. And this is just another example of how accessible design is just plain good design, and it can actually help your business. So um, Drixo saw a 2.5% conversion rate uplift, and again, they predicted the 12-month business value, which was um, a little over 300,000 euros per month uh, for the year. So um, the fourth tip is to be mindful of slow networks by designing pages that load fast. And this is usually not a topic that comes to mind when thinking about accessibility, because to, usually people think of uh, users who are blind or need uh, assistive technologies. But it's actually important to when you're considering global audiences who have maybe slower or unstable network connections. And with mobile being more prevalent uh, than desktop in many regions, low, low bandwidth is really an important consideration. So here's an example of um, Pinterest, which many of you know and probably use the, the app instead of the website. But um, recently, they were focused on improving the web when they wanted to uh, focus on international growth. So they sped up their website, and they included um, some network resilience features, so like push notifications, even that work offline. Um, this is made possible by PWA technologies. So uh, you can see that uh, they ended up with a faster web experience, of course. Um, they were reliable on unstable connections, which allowed them to engage with users who lost connection. And as a result, the core engagements on their web, their mobile website increased by 60%. So this is huge for such a big company that um, many, especially us designers, use quite often. And finally, um, probably the most obvious um, topic within accessibility is being able to support assistive technologies that are specific to your platform. So just as you support the input, the input methods of touch on a phone or a touchscreen device with a keyboard or the mouse, it's important to make use of assistive uh, technologies that help uh, individuals with disabilities. So this includes screen readers. Um, and in this example from Think with Google, this is actually really uh, accessible by screen readers because when you're tabbing through the content, there's uh, skip links to make to allow users to skip through the long uh, menu navigations as you see on the right side. So instead of having to tab through every single item here, they can just go straight to the content that they want to see. And basically, they have a screen reader that would read this content out loud to them. So you can imagine how annoying it might be if uh, companies or websites don't implement this skip link. Uh, but besides screen readers, there's also magnification devices, hearing aids. Um, and for people who are deaf, it's really important to um, offer captions for your videos on your site. So a lot of different ways you can address this. And there are some, uh, an easy way to measure how accessible your website is, is on web.dev. And when you run your website through this um, link, you can see, first of all, your speed score. So this helps you to speed up your site for slower networks, and also your accessibility score. So it goes through some audits of 
um, some quick uh, automated checks that you can fix right away. Um, and all of these tips will be available on Thursday when it will be published on Think with Google. So the link uh, is here on the next slide. Uh, it will be on thinkwithgoogle.co.uk, and you can uh, grab all these tips so you can share with your company. Thanks. Back to Anna. Um, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone, all our amazing speakers today. And I hope that our audience got really inspired by very good best practices and case studies, accessibility examples, and Lina's CRO course. So now you know where to go if you want to find more things. So for now, let's maybe start with the pre-submitted questions while we are retrieving really good questions from the chat. And uh, there were actually a few good ones on the best practices that we presented in our videos. So the first ones, like there were a few questions on the top tabs. Um, first one is, uh, for example, how do we ensure the top tabs remain obvious as a navigation for, for example, non-tech savvy users, for like baby boomers? Uh, also, the, another question, how Many top tabs can I add to the navigation panel if they are scrollable? Uh, and also what is, yeah, that's that's kind of very similar. What is the maximum amount of the top tabs that I can have? Uh, and uh, if they, for example, if the text label is long, what should I do? So if any of the speakers wants to take that one. Uh, I can take this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I'd like to go with like three different steps. The first one is number of items. So for that, it really depends on where you're going to locate your navigation items. Because for instance, let's, if we think of a mobile web, and if we are about to locate our icons next to the logo, uh, what I would say is the number would be maximum four. Because otherwise, if you keep adding the others, the, it will be too crowded. But if you are uh, displaying these icons on a separate row, uh, what I've seen as a maximum was Facebook with six uh, icons and they don't have labels but we'll come to that later and the second part is like what happens if we use a swipeable uh, region then I would say that of course there is no limit for that you can put as much as you want but here you have to remind yourself that obviously the icon that is or the navigation item on the second place will be clicked much much more than the sixth or the seventh one right obviously because users will be seeing it and the the other ones they'll be hindered somewhere uh, on the right uh, for that the order of the navigation items are very important you should be locating them wisely and if you think that oh this is still really important for us uh, i would say for instance, OK, you can put it uh, on the seventh, as a seventh icon on the navigation, but you might also consider exposing it on the main page, too, so that users can see it somehow, even if they don't swipe. And the last part was about, OK, how we can make it obvious that this is a navigation and everyone can engage with it. So for that, uh, I would say the first thing is don't reinvent the wheel with the icons please do use the universal icons. For instance, if you're going to say that, oh, the items that I like, don't use brain and trying to add smarts by saying that, oh, but actually we don't like by our heart, but, but with, my, with our brain. No, just use uh, heart or, or star. And the second part is always uh, like follow intrinsic and cognitive design patterns. And what I mean with this is, for instance, there's an, if there's an active state and a passive state of a navigation item, please make it clear, make it obvious for the users so that uh, they, 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 don't, they don't get confused. And if you just skip these two, uh, like not use the universal icons and uh, don't follow the intrinsic design principles, I would say that not even the tech savvy users, but even uh, generations that people wouldn't understand you. And the last part is the adding uh, text labels. And um, when, when I was working as like product manager as well, always the objection of adding like text labels were coming from designers because they were saying that no, our design is so neat, clean. We don't want to destroy it with the text. Uh, but at this point, this is a. Uh, this is a trade-off between functionality and being nice. And as Lena indicated uh, at the beginning, so 
most of the users, they really care about the be beauty of the website. So I would say, do include the tags. Text. If they are really long, I don't have anything to say. Try to use a smaller font or try to shorten the, the text field. And last, before I finish up with the question, I also want to say this. So around two, three months ago, you must have realized that the Spotify, they changed their navigation. And before they were displaying five items on their navigation, and now it's only three. So they have home, search, and my library. So the moral of this story is that oh, and don't, don't rely on, oh, we have slidable cursor, we can put as much as we want, but always uh, keep it uh, short as short as possible. That would be, thank you. Thank you so much, Meta. And Thanks. I think that on, on the icon specifically, there was actually another question uh, submitted by our EMEA um, audience that labels underneath the icon. So uh, how come some companies still don't use that even if they're well known? So what is basically the best, best practice if you are a very well known brand and people know what is hidden behind the icon, do they still have to use the text label? And yeah, I would encourage all speakers also to say something on that. Yeah, I can just give a short uh, reply to that. So sometimes we will see, you know, big companies do something that might not resonate with our own testing. And that is why we always have to A-B test. So with your design, with your visitors, you won't know if a best practice is applicable for you. Um, even the ones we give here today, uh, we don't know if it's going to work. It needs to be tested. Um, so we've seen amazing results from having labels under the icons. Um, maybe the companies who do not have them have tested and seen that for them, it, it didn't matter. But for so many of even the biggest companies, they don't test. So don't just follow um, the trendsetters out there. It might be that they are um, simply going for aesthetics always test it, always check up what best practices are out there and then test it. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Lena. And uh, now I want to actually take a few questions from the live chat. And uh, thank you so much for all your questions on the East Pack. Uh, so this is to Emiliana. Uh, and I, I think it's a really, really great point. So for example, so East Pack website is now different in Italy and UK. Uh, so how do you manage that? And uh, because there are contradicting res results between different regional web websites, what is the best way to move forward? Right, so keep um, keep the separate versions versus keep a single source, but acknowledging that there will be some countries that may not where it may not work still. Um, yeah, that, yeah, this is an amazing question, and uh, I know that sometimes we present some results, and you go live, and you go and check the website, and you see something different. It's a matter of the companies keep testing. Uh, uh, so what was working like a year ago, maybe is not working now because the, the audience is changing, uh, the way of the website is rebranding itself or is positioning some items in the, in the website is changing. Uh, so related to the question is uh, not always um, good to follow only best practices, but as Lina was saying, keep A-B testing. If you see something that is working, uh, it's amazing as we saw, uh, but never forget that something that is working now might not work in the future. Uh, so that's why you see maybe uh, different countries approaching uh, the design on a, of the same website in a small different ways, uh, because they realize that it's not working for them, and then they decided to test something else. Uh, so you can find at the end of the day different versions of the same website, based on the fact that they A-B tested in the past and they are A-B testing right now. And if it, if it was working or wasn't working in the past, it doesn't mean that it's not working now. So it's a it's an ongoing process that allows you to be live always with the best version of your website. Um, thanks so much, Emiliano. Um, so now we will actually address 
the question that was asked both in the chat and submitted before. Uh, and it's also, we discussed this a little bit in the first live stream. So is the one-step checkout generally better to compare it to classic checkout with uh, step, several steps in mobile? Um, yeah, thank you, Branislav, for this question. And I think yeah, Meta uh, can, uh, I can answer. And then after that, then you have the other speakers yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, for this, it really depends how we like uh, define one step checkout. Because usually, like in a retail web, uh, company, I would say the the the, the checkout is for, uh, composed of like login, delivery address, payment, and then maybe review, right? And when you say one step checkout, if you are just exposing everything when the users comes into the to the page, I would say it's not going to work because basically in this funnel. Uh, like there, there are 15, 20 different input fields. And if you just display all the content the users when they just step in, uh, there's a, the chance of at the abandonment is higher, obviously. Uh, what I would say, but if we divide the content into small chunks and uh, like uh, serve them in, in small chunks where they can digest the content, then we can have a higher chance uh, of conversions. But what you can do, for instance, you, you can prefer to have a stepper on the top of the screen, or as Mango or ASOS does, you can prefer to have a vertical uh, flow where users can still see everything in the same page. You can use it. But what I'm saying is, if the user is on the delivery address field, somehow uh, like hide the payment details, et cetera, these input fields so that they don't feel overwhelmed. And the other thing is, I think the, the one which is most important is, what is your user base? For instance, if you're a company with 90, 95% of the traffic is coming from the returning users, then I would say, yeah, even the one stepper would, uh, would have been nice. But if, if you're just entering a new market where most of the users are going to be new users, then this, this stepper one might uh, work better. And in my, in my own opinion, again, this is a subjective approach, but I would say that the best approach to have the best experience both for new and uh, returning users. And for that, my humble opinion is to use kind of steppers. But when the returning users joins to the funnel, you can just start them from the last review uh, part so that you can skip the previous steps. Since you already have the delivery address payment details, you can just show them the summary, and then they can finalize their uh, purchase. If you have still further questions, Please do write them here. I'll try to talk with you later. Yeah, Thank or you. we will collect them. Yeah. In any, any case, for any of the questions that we will not take at this live stream, we will have four more live streams, and hopefully we will address them all. So any other speaker would have any take on the uh, oh. checkout design? Yeah, so one point about that. I completely agree with the meta here. Uh, one thing that we just need to think about is that sometimes some of the one-click purchase solutions uh, have an option where you just click one button and then the purchase is done. So there's no confirmation, there's no, are you Lena Hansen? Nothing like that. And there we need to be careful because the conversion rate might go up, but if complaints also go up and if second uh, purchases go down, so the customer lifetime value goes down, then we are uh, annoying them. So for instance, um, in Google Pay, they have, are you leaving hands on? Yes. Is this your address? Yes. Then we understand that we are making a purchase. We just need that, that um, validation that they are aware of that they are actually purchasing. If that is on, uh, on board, I'm totally for any kind of simplifying checkout. Awesome. Um... So now I think we have time for one more. And I actually want to read one of the pre-submitted questions because it was very technical one, and again, on the best practices for mobile. So sticky header, right? So sticky header, we discussed that in the video. How do I know uh, it's not better to keep the page clean and not distract the user while more uh, with more options? When a user scrolls down, it usually means that they want to see what else is there in the page, and uh, then the sticker header should pro is probably just a distraction to them. So, um, any anybody wants to discuss the sticky header? So, just one a quick solution there: um, have it visible in the beginning of the page when they start scrolling, then make it go up, make it disappear when they when you know they continue uh, scrolling. 
that way it won't be around bugging people um and when they just do a bit of a tap upwards then you can just fold it out so there's technical solutions for that mm -hmm. i totally agree and i yeah. just like that really small detail it really depends on again your user base too just you can check the analytics and see the screen resolutions and if if most of your users are using small devices then keeping a sticky header might be really costly for you because you are decreasing the the space that users can check and in a really small region think think of it as well also there may be other ways how to introduce like this navigation as a like implementing the back button like when you can always return to the up to the top and yeah the, the navigation is a very complex topic and yeah. this is something that you should always be testing and it's not just one test it's it's really a multiple of research things uh, exactly. studies and that you have to do even different mm -hmm. pages in the funnel can have different navigations for instance you might be exposing the search bar yeah. on the main page page but you might prefer to hide it on the basket for instance these are all topics of a b test <laughs> we're just talking to speakers there yeah. <laughs> but we remember you guys over here um so thank you so much i I think we are running out of time, unfortunately, but thank you for all your amazing questions. Again, we're, we took a note of all of them, uh, and uh, they will hopefully help, help us to shape the content for the rest of the live streams. Today's session was on Global UX best practices. Please submit feedback in the feedback form. We will send it out tomorrow after all live streams in all four time zones are done. Uh, and yeah, so there is a thank you slide and where we remind you again that there is a hashtag that you can use in the social media for all your uh, feedback on the Mobile UX Marathon, what you would like to see and to hear any useful thoughts that you've got from, from us. We hope it was useful. Uh, so thank you so much. Thanks to our amazing speakers. I'm just going to show you all one by one. Thank you, Emiliano. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Lena. Thank you. And thanks, Raisa. Thank you, Mel. So thanks, everyone. Bye, and see you next week, you. next Tuesday, same time. Bye.